John Bonet's story unfolds in the picturesque town of Boulder, Colorado, where the tranquility of family life was abruptly shattered. Christmas Day, 1996. A six year old beauty queen named John Bonet, a cryptic ransom note, and a family home transformed into a crime scene. All of this set the stage for a roller coaster of investigations and theories that continue to captivate the world. Before diving into any of the theories, let's paint a vivid portrait of the Ramseys. John Ramsey, a prosperous businessman, weaves together a blended family, introducing complexities that add layers to our unfolding drama. We will begin to peel back layers, exploring the peculiar ransom note, demanding a specific sum eerily aligned with John's annual bonus, and ponder the absence of forced entry casting shadows on the possibility of a cover-up. From their initial interactions with law enforcement to the strategic move of hiring a lawyer, we unravel the post-disappearance chapters that have fueled speculations surrounding the parents' involvement. As the media descended upon Boulder, the Ramseys found themselves thrust into a spotlight that turned their lives into a real-life drama. Interviews, public appearances and emotional displays unfolded against the backdrop of intense scrutiny. See how the media's lens shaped public perceptions and how the Ramsey family navigated this uncharted territory. This is the story of little John Benet Ramsey. On the morning of December 26th, 1996, John and Patsy Ramsey awoke to a parent's worst nightmare. Their six-year-old daughter, John Bonet, was missing from her bed in their Boulder, Colorado home. That day was meant for preparations for a family trip to Michigan, but it took a grim turn when Patsy discovered a ransom note on the stairs demanding $118,000 for John Bonet's safe return. Despite the note's explicit warning against involving the police, Patsy immediately called law enforcement, as well as friends and family, to aid in the search. It was 5.52 a.m. when Patsy Ramsey called 911. 911 emergency. Oh, my name. What's going on? 553. What's going on there, ma'am? We have a kidnapping. Hi, please. Explain to me what's going on, okay? There, we have a... There's a note left in our daughter's gun. A note was left in your daughter's yes. gun. How old is your daughter? Six years old. She's blonde. Six years old. How long ago was this? I don't know. I just found the note. And my daughter's gun. Is it saying who took her? What? Is it saying who took her? I don't know. It's, there's, a, there's a ransom note here. It's a ransom note? It says SBTC. Victory. Please. Okay, what's your name? Are you Kathy Pat- Ramsey? I'm the mother. Oh my God. Please. I'm, okay, I'm sending an off the phone, okay? Please. Do you know how long she's been gone? No, I don't. Please, we just got out and she ran here. Oh my God, please. Okay, girl. Please, somebody. I am, honey. Please. Take a deep breath please. away, okay? Hurry, hurry, hurry. Kathy, 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 Kathy.
Happy. Happy. When the police arrived at 5.55 a.m., they found no signs of forced entry, but failed to search a room in the basement where John Bonet's lifeless body would eventually be discovered. The initial hours of the investigation were marred by mistakes. Only John Bonet's room was cordoned off, allowing friends and family to roam freely, potentially cramp potentially compromising evidence. The police also shared discovered evidence with the Ramses and delayed conducting formal interviews. In a fateful decision, detectives instructed John Ramsey and a family friend to inspect the house, leading them to the basement where John Bonet's body was found. John Ramsey's immediate action of removing the duct tape from his daughter's mouth and picking up his daughter's body disturbed the crime scene, destroying crucial evidence. The autopsy revealed that John Benet Ramsey died from asphyxiation. Back to the beginning. In order to grasp the details and the complexity of this case, let's go back to the beginning. Before becoming central figures in one of the most high-profile murder cases in American history, John and Patsy Ramsey led lives characterized by success and affluence. John Ramsey, born on December 7, 1943, in Lincoln, Nebraska, grew up in a modest household. His father was a decorated World War II pilot and John inherited a strong work ethic and ambition. He attended Michigan State University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering. John continued his education, obtaining a Master of Business Administration from Michigan State. John's professional life was marked by notable achievements. He ventured into the business world and eventually became the president and CEO of Access Graphics, a computer services company based in Boulder, Colorado. His success in business contributed to the family's affluence and social standing. Patsy Ramsey, born Patricia Ann Powell on December 29, 1956, hailed from a middle-class family in Parkersburg, West Virginia. She was a beauty queen winning the title of Miss West Virginia in 1977. She attended West Virginia University, studying journalism. After graduating, Patsy moved to Atlanta, where she met John Ramsey, who was recently divorced. They married in 1980 and had a son named Burke in 1987, followed by John Bonet in 1990. John's successful career and Patty's social charm made them prominent figures in the Boulder community. Their life seemed perfect, with John Bonet's beauty pageant success adding to the family's image. Much of the rest of America sees these pageants as tacky, even exploitative. But the Ramses defend them. I mean, all the children there had the same penchant for performance. on a, a little stage performing in front of parents and grandparents that happened to be videotaped by the people putting on the pageants. This is another disturbing thing that I found out in my research. 
the photographer that took photos of all the girls at John Bonet's pageants and also did individual photo shoots with the Ramses is in prison for, for child prawn. at a local mall where she plays a toy saxophone and gets a warm round of applause from the shoppers. Tragically, John Bonet would be murdered at Christmas, her happiest time of the year. I want to be a doctor or a nurse. Okay. To help people get well. A pediatrician. Great. Thank you so much, John Bonet. Let's give her a big hand. John Ramsey's first wife was Lucinda Posh. They had three children together Elizabeth, Melinda, and John Andrew. His eldest daughter, Elizabeth, was killed in a car crash at age 22 in 1992. According to a state police report, Elizabeth Ramsey was a passenger in the car, which went out of control on rain-slicked I-55 at County Line Road in Chicago. During their investigation, the Boulder Police Department requested a copy of the autopsy report. Also during the investigation, Boulder Police went to Atlanta to interview John Ramsey's former wife and other family members and friends. I found an article by the Denver Post written by Michael Booth. And it states that John Ramsey and his current wife, Patsy, also flew to Atlanta to support Ramsey's former wife, Lucinda Ramsey Johnson, as she talked to police. This was per family spokesman Pat Corton. Johnson told Atlanta newspapers that she expected Boulder police to ask questions that could confirm her claims that two older children from her former marriage with John Ramsey were with her on December 26th when six-year-old John Bonet was killed. Andrew Ramsey was 20 and his sister Melinda was 25. Also in this same article, Pat Corton, the family spokesman, said, in response to media questions that a partial autopsy report released did not confirm long-term sexual abuse. He also posted quotes from John Bonet's pediatrician, Francisco Booth, on the family's computer website, strongly denying that there was ever any indication of abuse in the years that he saw John Bonet. Experts who analyzed the partial report for media outlets did say it showed evidence of a sexual assault at the same time the murder took place. 
scrapes and swelling on her genitals, back and head, would be consistent with both a violent sexual assault and a brutal physical attack, according to Sheila Rappaport, a Denver prosecutor who has handled similar attacks. John Bonet's treatment history with her pediatrician was made public. Here is a brief summary. She began as a patient in late 1991. In December of 91, she had fever, cough, and wheezing. The next 10 months, she had usual colds and coughs of a toddler. By two and a half years old, she had developed a history of coughs accompanied by low-grade fever. In July of 1993, Patsy has cancer. John Bonet Ramsey lives with her grandmother and has regression in toileting and eating. At three years, one month, her buttocks were chafed red from diarrhea, as was her vaginal area. Two months later, cough and stuffed nose, poor sleep, grouchy from fatigue, and bad breath. End of 93, three years old, still drinking from a bottle. October of 1994, scar on left cheek from being hit with a golf club, allegedly accidentally wearing pull-ups because of bedwetting. May 1995, fell and landed on nose. Seven and a half months later, tripped and hit head above left eye. Stuffy nose, bad breath, cough. March 1996, cough. Two months later, bent the nail back on left hand in another fall. Three months before death, Patsy Ramsey told the doctor that John Bonet was a good sleeper, easy to put to bed, easy to wake, not interested in the opposite sex, quote, behaved modestly in public, didn't engage in sex play with her friends. She was, however, asking about sex roles and reproduction. Two months before death, stuffy nose and bad breath, allergic rhinitis. November 12th, 1996, runny nose, cold sore, sneezing. Three weeks later, eyesight was checked. In early December of 96, she was sick, but did not go to the doctor. Dr. Bove told a reporter covering the story that John Bonet had an average number of physician visits for a child her age. It turns out that the doctor himself was one of the ones in the house the morning of the murder gave Patsy Ramsey medication and also took a walk with John Ramsey. And when John Ramsey returned from that walk, he had decided to lawyer up. He was also at the Fernie's house and was still there at midnight. That brings us to the Ramsey's friends, John and Barbara Fernie. They are good friends of the Ramsey's and they were called by Patsy on the morning of December 25th, 1996, when John Bonet was kidnapped. They arrived to the house to give comfort to the Ramseys. Barbara and John also opened their house for Patsy, John, and Burke, and they stayed with them for several weeks. Barbara took care of Patsy when she almost drowned herself with sadness. She helped Burke back to school and helped to arrange security around him. The other notable friends are Glenn and Susan Stein. They were among the strongest supporters of the Ramseys. These friends were the last to see John Bonet alive when the Ramseys dropped off a Christmas gift at their home Christmas night. Glenn Stein followed the Ramseys to Atlanta in the summer of 98 after resigning as vice president for budget and finance at the University of Colorado. He joined John Ramsey at his new job at Jalio North America as chief financial officer. Stein, like Ramsey, is a graduate of Michigan State University. Susan apparently remained in Boulder, where she had been employed as a director of planning and institutional research at the university. And their son is close friends with Burke. Now, I found this a little bit odd that John Ramsey's friend, Mr. Stein, would move away from his wife to work with John. Odd. The last couple we're going to talk about in this video is Fleet and Priscilla White. They were close friends of the Ramseys, who were also called to the house that morning. 
but they also had had Christmas Eve dinner at the White's house. The Whites have children the same age as John Bonet, and they had hosted a Christmas dinner for the Ramsey family. Although Fleet, an oil executive, was a pallbearer in John Bonet's funeral, he confronted the Ramseys shortly afterward and almost came to blows with John. He was allegedly concerned about the way he perceived the Ramseys to be reacting to John Bonet's death and not cooperating with the investigation. A major witness for the prosecution, Fleet, along with Priscilla, have authored several letters imploring the appointment of an independent prosecutor for the grand jury. Remember um, what happened in the evening, what you were doing in the evening? Well, we went to the White's house where they had family and relatives, friends, I guess. We were perhaps the only friends there uh, for a Christmas dinner. Uh, do you remember anything else about um, that Christmas dinner at Fleet White's? Nothing notable. It was a family dinner. Um, what, if anything, did you do after Fleet White's dinner? Uh, we left. Uh, Patsy wanted to drop two gifts off uh, at the Walkers and the Steins, which we did on the way home. Uh, we pulled in the driveway into the garage. Uh, John Bonet was asleep in the back of the car. Uh, I carried her upstairs and put her to bed. Um, is that the last time you saw Jean Bonnet alive? Yes, it was. Right. Um, do you know if uh, Patsy um, joined you in the bedroom uh, when you put her to put Jean Bonnet to bed? I don't recall. That um, she was in the bedroom when I was in the bedroom. Do you um, uh, remember what Jean Bonnet was doing that evening when you were over at the Fleet Whites? She was playing with Daphne upstairs. Uh, she and Daphne had both received a, uh, a little bead-making machine. and She and I and Fleet and Daphne sat on the floor and made necklace beads. Do you remember anything else? Um, that's the highlight of my memory. Do you re have any memory of what she was doing after you left Fleet White's. She was asleep. How soon after you left Fleet White did she go to sleep? I don't know. Sometime between the time she got in the car and when we arrived home. Um, do you remember whether she woke up at any time between the time you saw her asleep in the car and the time you put her to bed? That she night? did not. Um, um, at that point, after you put her to bed, what, if anything, did you do? Um, I went downstairs to get Burke in bed. Um, he was putting together a little plastic toy that he'd gotten for Christmas. Uh, I helped him finish it so he could get off to bed. And we did that, and uh, then I went to bed myself. When you say you went to bed yourself, do you remember um, exactly the sequence by which you prepared for going to bed that night? I think I took my clothes off, brushed my teeth, put my pajamas on, and crawled into bed. That's... Did you do anything else? Not that I remember. Uh, did you um, um, use anything to help yourself go to sleep? I took a melatonin tablet. Do you know the um, amount of melatonin you took? No, it was an over-the-counter mm -hmm. tablet. Was it a single tablet or half a tablet or two uh, tablets? I think it was a single tablet, as I recall. Um, do you remember the brand? No. Um, do you know uh, or remember whether or not you read anything before going to sleep? I read for a few minutes, I, as I recall, before I turned the light out. Um, do you remember at any point um, Patsy joining you in bed that night? Patsy was in bed before I went to bed. Um, do you remember what Patsy was wearing when she got into bed or was in bed? I don't remember specifically, no. All right. Um, did you wake up at all during the night? I did not. Um, was this routine pretty much the normal routine um, when you went to bed at night, when you were at home? To take off his clothes? To do precisely what he said. Was anything different than, yeah, anything yeah. different than that? Pretty standard routine. Pretty standard routine. And. Um, 
Do Except you, I usually didn't take a melatonin tablet every night. Um, why were you taking the melatonin that night? I wanted to be sure I slept well because we were going to get up early and I was going to fly to Minneapolis and then on to Michigan. I wanted to be fresh. Do you know if um, of Mrs. Ramsey um, was taking any um, medication to help her sleep? Or Not to my any, knowledge. Any melatonin? No, I don't believe so. Um, you mentioned that you were going to um, fly to, um, where was it? Minneapolis, Minneapolis. and on to uh, Charlevoix, Michigan. Um, you have a pilot's license, I presume? Yes, I do. Um, can you um, tell me what sort of pilot's license you have? I have a commercial license. I have a flight instructor license for airplanes, for instrument flying. I have a multi-engine rating, and I have an instrument rating. Um, what sort of planes does that allow you to fly? Anything below 12,500 pounds gross weight. Um, does that include um, twin engines? Yes. Does it include any kind of a jet? Most jets are over 12,500 pounds that I um, know of. May I ask you um, where you learned to fly? My dad taught me. Um, did you ever have occasion to fly when you were in the military? No, I did not, other than in flying clubs. Um, Was that the normal means by which you would travel? Uh, you would fly yourself, or, or did you take commercial airliners? Travel and travel around the country, whenever you were traveling. If I was flying for business, I normally would take commercial airlines. If I was flying personally with my family, we normally flew ourselves. Um, you say that, um, I understand that you were in the Navy, is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, when you were in the Navy, um, can you describe, if you remember, pretty much uh, uh, what area you were responsible for as a serviceman? Well, I was a uh, civil engineer corps officer. Uh, I was stationed in the Philippines for two years. I was uh, the uh, civil engineer for the Naval Supply Depot in the Philippines. Um, I was transferred to Atlanta, where I was the base engineer for the Naval Air Station in Atlanta. Could you describe what you were doing as an engineer? Uh, contract management. Uh, we ran all the base utilities, um, uh, maintenance and repair, road construction. Um, long term planning, site planning. Were you actually involved in any hands on engineering projects? Uh, I had a staff that did that. I was in charge of the staff. So, uh, were you ever involved in any of the actual construction? Did I pound nails? No. Or, or do anything like that in any sort of manual labor way? In the military? Yeah, in the military. I did not. Okay. Um, when you were not in the military, did you do that? I enjoy remodeling and doing work with my hands, yes. Um, did you do any remodeling in your home in Boulder? We did uh, quite a bit of remodeling. Uh, I did not do any of the work there, mm -hmm. as I recall. Uh, did you have occasion to do remodeling in any of your other homes? We have remodeled every home you've owned. Have you personally done any remodeling in any of these homes? Yes. Um, when you were in the Navy, um, you, you went through basic training, naturally. I went through Officer Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, your, can you just describe briefly what your basic training was like? Uh, it was uh, physical training. It was uh, navigation, uh, celestial navigation, mm -hmm. uh, seamanship, rules of the road relative to ship movement. Um, and generally uh, uh, familiarization with military procedures and, and uh, the military system. You say that one of the areas that you were instructed in was seamanship? Navigation mm -hmm. and piloting. You, you were being prepared to captain a ship. Did uh, any of your basic training involve, and I don't know if they still do this, um, learning various nautical knots? 
No. Um, do you sail at all? I used to. Uh, in uh, did you um, pilot your own sailboat, or did you yes. have someone do it for you? No. Um, did you receive any training in in uh, sailing? No. Um, are you familiar with the various knots involved in sailing? I'm really not. I should be, but I'm not. All right. So, uh, how would you generally moor your craft? I would uh, tie it up on a cleat. Um, was there any sort of knot that you used that you could identify that has a technical term? I don't know the technical term for it. Have you had occasion to be able to look at the knot that was uh, tied around the um, so-called paintbrush garret? I have not. Okay. Is there any reason why you haven't? It's very painful for me, Mr. Hoffman. I understand that. But um, um, with your nautical training, do you think that you could in any way be able to identify the sort of knot? No. Do you know whether or not any of, uh, uh, if your private investigators um, um, hired anyone to look at uh, the way in which that knot was made and to give uh, a report on it? Not to my knowledge. So we just heard John asked about his training in the Navy, and he stated with a definitive no that he never learned any kind of knots. While doing some quick research on the internet, I found several knots that are basic to Navy training. First, we're going to take a look at the garret around John Bonet's neck when she was found. And now these are some knots that people in the Navy learn to tie. According to John Ramsey, when he found John Bonet's body in the basement room, he removed a piece of duct tape from her mouth. This piece of duct tape was later analyzed, and it was found that the impression from John Bonet's mouth was static, and there was no evidence of movement. This means that the duct tape was very likely placed on her mouth after she was dead. Why would an intruder place duct tape on her mouth? I think it's possible that the duct tape was placed on John Bonet's mouth by John Ramsey as part of the post-death staging of the kidnapping scenario. The reason John removed the tape when he, quote, discovered John Bonet's body, he may have made sure to handle that duct tape. The so-called ransom note. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed. And if you want to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw. $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you so I advise you not to provoke them. 
speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices, and if any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions, and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around. So don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It is up to you now, John. Victory. S. B. T. C. The ransom note demands $118,000. And we know that $118,000 was the amount of the bonus that John Ramsey received as a bonus. This money is electronically placed in his 401k at the end of the year. So the person responsible has to have a very unique, intimate knowledge about his financial workings, and therefore the person would have to be related to his employment. The writer must have had direct knowledge of John Ramsey's bonus, and we can speculate about who else could have possibly known about the bonus, but who is the one person that we can almost guarantee knew about the bonus? I believe that John could have included the figure in the note for multiple reasons. First, to misdirect police, and create a potential suspect pool at Access Graphics, the, the place he worked. And second, as a reverse psychology strategy, knowing that he would already be a suspect, if John was directly accused of writing the note, he could argue that including the figure would only lead back to himself. And third, consider the amount demanded in the note is a relatively small sum. I mean, $118,000 for a small foreign faction to split up? The Ramseys contend that a kidnapper came through the basement window and went up to John Bonet's room. If this was the case, the kidnapper passed several exits on the way back to the basement. If the kidnapping scenario was true and the intruder intended on taking John Bonet, he would have used those exits. Why would the kidnapper go back the same way he entered? In other words, if the kidnapper could not fit John Bonet out of his window, which we are told is the same window, that the kidnapper entered, it makes no sense for him to just give up. That is why I believe that the suitcase under the window only makes sense as a stage scene. If the intruder used the suitcase for a step, would they not have placed it parallel and up against the wall for better balance? Considering what we believe to be a stage scene, it would not be a stretch to conclude that John probably manufactured the scuff mark to create the appearance that an intruder went through that window. John claims to have broken the window after being locked out of the house. But months before the morning in question, it is very possible that John actually broke the window the night of the murder. But why the story about being locked out? It is important to note that according to the Boulder PD, the metal grate outside the window was reported as undisturbed on the morning in question. This would suggest that all activity around the suitcase and broken window occurred inside the basement. I think it's possible that John utilized the window and suitcase and staged them to create a scene, a scene that police could not ignore as a possible entryway for an intruder. John was also unaccounted for around 10.30 a.m. on the day in question. He later claimed he was in the basement looking for anything out of place. If this is true, why did John fail to check the wine room? If an innocent John Ramsey had genuinely searched the basement alone at 10.30 a.m., there would be no reason for him to skip the wine cellar room. An innocent John would have unlocked it, turned on the light, and discovered his daughter's body. Maybe John had a reason 
maybe guilty John had a reason for failing to discover the body when he was alone. And maybe he wanted to, quote, discover the body with someone else present. This is why he chose to discover the body at 1 p.m. while Fleet was in the basement with him. Let's take a closer look at the evidence. A piece of paintbrush was used for the garret that was found tightened around John Bonet's neck. Evidence from the autopsy suggests the paintbrush was also used in a sexual manner to abuse John Bonet. Although the paintbrush was from Patsy's kit, the hand strength required to break a paintbrush would be difficult to achieve by most women, let alone Patsy Ramsey. Most men, on the other hand, possess the strength to break a paintbrush into three pieces. The paintbrush was broken the night of the murder, and I believe this could be a small but crucial piece of evidence that yet again points towards John. The knot used to secure the cord to the broken paintbrush was somewhat intricate. Like I said earlier, John was in the Navy, and he was a recreational sailor. He knew how to tie an assortment of knots, At 1 p.m. on the day in question, Detective Art asked Fleet White and John Ramsey to search the house again. Minutes later, John would emerge from the basement, holding in front of himself the stiffened body of John Benet. Fleet White and John Ramsey would later tell police they opened the basement door that Officer French failed to open and found John Benet wrapped in a blanket with duct tape on her mouth and cord tied around her neck and wrists. John would later say that he attempted to remove the bindings. After John placed John Bonet's body on the living room carpet, he asked Detective Art if John Bonet was dead. Detective Art would later say that John Bonet was clearly dead. During this moment, Detective Art would initially question John's innocence. Does John's question seem genuine to you? Again, John carried her stiffened body from the basement. John spent time attempting to remove the bindings. Would he not have known that she was dead? Could his question have been an insincere attempt to create doubt in his involvement? Now let's take a look at the ransom note. Identifying the mind behind the ransom note is the key to identifying its author. For example, the use of the term stray dog found in the ransom note. In a police interview from 1998, John uses the term stray dog to refer to strangers that Patsy would invite into the home. This could be a simple coincidence, and many may dismiss it as such. But consider how many contexts that you have used the term stray dog. I'm going to ask you um, if you recognize any of the handwriting in the document. recognize it as mine or someone else's? Well, now just... I'll go to the next question. Um, do you recognize any of the handwriting as being your handwriting? Not particularly. Okay. So you couldn't say with any degree of certainty that that was your handwriting? No. Eight ten a.m. Arndt arrived at the Ramsey home and meets John Ramsey for the first time. How did he strike you? Cordial. Cordial? Mm-hmm. Upset? Cordial. Distraught? Cordial. Did it strike you at all that he was, that that was behavior that was unusual for somebody whose child was just kidnapped? It's been my experience that people respond to trauma in different ways. So if someone has a response that is different from mine, I don't put judgment to it. I'll just I'll just note it. And that is what she says she did all morning. Make mental notes of all things curious, including, she says, the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey remained apart in separate rooms for most of the day. That at one point, she says John Ramsey took time out in the middle of the crisis to read his mail. I remember seeing John in the kitchen, looking through his mail, and I, I made a note that he was looking at his mail, and then I wondered, where did your mail come from? Isn't it possible maybe he was opening the mail looking for a clue from the kidnapper? I don't know, and I I don't speculate. 
Um, it's a piece of information that I see. It's uh, something that I know. You thought it was unusual, however. I can say that it stuck out. 10 a.m., the deadline imposed by the writer of the ransom note for a telephone call. 10 o'clock comes and goes, and there's no acknowledgement within the house from anyone that the deadline imposed by the author of the ransom note has come and gone. Nobody said it's 10 o'clock and the kidnappers haven't called? Nobody said that. Was that something else you took note of? Absolutely. By 10.30 in the morning, Arndt was the only police officer in the house with John and Patsy Ramsey, their pastor, and four family friends. As they waited for news, the tension was mounting. Arndt called her station house for backup repeatedly, but none had arrived. How many times did you call the police department asking where your backup was and what was going on? Well, I remember at least two calls. Both times I was told everybody's in the meeting. Um, they got your message. And uh, that was it. Were you feeling pressure being in charge of a group this large and with anxiety that high? I felt tremendous pressure. 1.01 p.m. Although the house had already been searched by patrolmen before she arrived, Arndt says that in order to break the building tension, she asked John Ramsey and his friend Fleet White to search the house again, top to bottom, looking for anything out of place. She says she gave them specific instructions not to touch anything. She says John Ramsey headed straight to the basement. She heard Fleet White scream for an ambulance and then a chilling discovery. For Arndt, the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. And I see John Ramsey carrying Jean Bonnet up the last three steps from the basement. And, um, and my mind exploded. And everything that I had noted that morning that stuck out instantly made sense. And Jean Bonnet was clearly dead. Then she's been dead for a while. I ordered him to put Jean Bonnet down. I knelt next to her and I leaned down to her face. And Jean leaned down opposite me. And um, his face was just inches from mine. And we had a nonverbal exchange that I will never forget. And he asked if she was dead. And I said, yes, she's dead. And I told him to go back to the room and to dial 911. And as we looked at each other, I remember, and I wore a shoulder holster, tucking my gun right next to me and consciously counting, I've got 18 bullets. Why did you do that? Because I didn't know if we'd all be alive when people showed up. I said that everything made sense in that instance. And uh, I knew what happened. Do you think your fear was well-founded? You bet I do. There's no doubt in my mind. To this day? Never wavered. You were afraid because you thought the killer was still in the house. I knew it. Absolutely? Absolutely. 1.10 p.m., Detective Arndt moved John Bonet's body from the hallway to the living room. John Ramsey came back into the living room, and he grabbed a throw that was on the back of a chair, and he says, can we please, could you please cover her body? And as he's saying it, he's already put the blanket on top of her. Arndt would later be harshly criticized for two so. key decisions asking John Ramsey to search the house and allowing John Ramsey to place the blanket on John Bonet's body. You had to know that that was going to contaminate evidence. Jean Bonet's body was in and of itself a crime scene. Would it be nice if John hadn't found Jean Bonet? Absolutely. And would it be nice if he hadn't put a blanket? Yeah, it would be great. And it would be nice if there were other people to help control and keep people away, that would have been wonderful. But that's not the circumstances that I had available that day. 
Still alone in the living room with John Ramsey, Arndt then heard Patsy Ramsey's voice. And I heard a wail, just a guttural moan, aching wail from the back area. It's probably one of the most pitiful things I've ever heard and anguished. And I saw the rest of the people, the Patsy and the pastor and the four friends, come from the den towards the living room. So I said, if you want to say goodbye to Jean Bonnet, this is the only time you'll have to do it. And, uh, oh, there's just so much. There's so much pain. And I called 911. I get my radio number, and I said, the kidnapping has turned into a murder. This house had suddenly become a homicide crime scene. Oh, it became hell. Jean Bonnet was brought up at about five minutes after one, and um, at 10 after one, nobody'd shown up. And I looked out the window to the street, and I saw an ambulance slowly drive by. And I thought, I am in the twilight zone. Meanwhile, the pastor led the Ramseys and their friends in prayer in the living room, holding hands as John Bonnet's body lay before them. I thought that would be the best way to organize everyone, to keep them distracted, to keep them from touching Jean Bonnet, and to keep them focused on something other than other than looking at Jean Bonnet. 1.20 p.m., after three hours as the only officer on what Arndt calls an incredibly tense crime scene, and 20 minutes after John Bonnet's body was found, backup finally arrived. The next day, the autopsy on John Bonnet was conducted. Linda Arndt was there. I hadn't seen savagery to, done to a child or even an adult until uh, the doctor peeled back her scalp and... Uh, saw that horrific uh, fracture to her head. It was the length of her head. It was eight and a half inches long, and there was something else even more disturbing. She had trauma to her vagina. vagina. What kind of trauma? It would be trauma that would be consistent with... uh, Injuries seen in sexual assault cases. Recently? I guess the best way to say that was what was seen was not a first-time injury. The coroner, in fact, said the evidence was inconclusive. But ABC News has confirmed that three medical experts who consulted for the Boulder Police Department concluded the injuries were consistent with prior sexual abuse. As the Ramsey investigation dragged on for weeks, then months, and then years, the criticism of Linda Arndt's actions that December day continued. But she still defends her actions, saying she has become a scapegoat for a flawed investigation. And Linda Arndt remains convinced that she knows who killed John Benet Ramsey. She will not say the killer's name, but has no doubt that justice will never be done. Do you think this person will ever be indicted, will ever be charged or convicted? No. What you're saying is, whoever killed John Bonet will get away with murder. Yes. Do you hear anything? No. Do not hear a thing. Sadly, no. You were on medication that night? I had taken a melatonin tablet, which is supposed to help you sleep. Uh, Mrs. Ramsey, the clothing. Well, the police were suspicious because you had your makeup on and you had the same clothing as you had worn the night before. Mm-hmm. When did you get dressed? I got up in the morning, got dressed. I had, the night before, had put my pants and sweater and bra and, you know, laid across the edge of the bathtub and I picked it up the next morning and put it back on. See, any, any parent that has taken early morning trips probably follows the same routine we did. We would get up, we'd get dressed, we'd get fully ready, we'd get the car loaded, and then we'd get the kids up. Quite often we'd get the kids up with their pajamas on and put them in the car. Okay. Um, 
that's standard parent 101 travel, I think. That's how we always did it. And, and one question that's, that's unpleasant, and I'm sorry for asking this, but what is your understanding as far as a possible sexual assault? I, I think that's inconclusive. I've been told that there was no penetration and that, that what was previously thought to be semen is not. Is there anything else either one of you would like to add? Just help us. If, if you're listening to this program and think you have information that can help, please help. Notice he's shaking his head no as he's asking for help. He really doesn't want help, nor does he need it. We're going to go to the Whites uh, that evening for a, a dinner. Uh, I remember John Bonet asking me to uh, help her ride her bike around the corner, around the block, her new bike that she'd gotten for Christmas. Um, that's generally what I remember that, that day. Do you remember um, what happened in the evening, what you were doing in the evening? Well, we went to the White's house where they had family and relatives, friends, I guess. We were perhaps seeing friends there uh, for Christmas dinner. Uh, do you remember anything else about um, that Christmas dinner at the White's? Nothing notable. It was a family dinner. Um, what, if anything, did you do after Fleet White's dinner? Uh, we left. Uh, Patsy wanted to drop two gifts off uh, at the Walkers and the Steins, which we did on the way home. Uh, we pulled in the driveway into the garage. Uh, John Bonet was asleep in the back of the car. Uh, I carried her upstairs and put her to bed. Um, is that the last time you saw John Bonet alive? Yes, it was. Um, do you know if uh, Patsy um, joined you in the bedroom uh, when you put her to put John Bonet to bed? I don't recall that um, she was in the bedroom when I was in the bedroom. Do you um, uh, remember what Jean Bonnet was doing that evening when you were over at the Fleet Whites? She was playing with Daphne upstairs. Uh, she and Daphne had both received a, uh, a little bead making machine, and she and I, and Fleet and Daphne, sat on the floor and made necklace beads. Do you remember anything else? Um, that's the highlight of my memory. Do you re have any memory of what she was doing after you left Fleet White's? She was asleep. How soon after you left Fleet White did she go to sleep? I don't know. Sometime between the time she got in the car and when we arrived home. Um, do you remember whether she woke up at any time between the time you saw her asleep in the car and the time you put her to bed? She night? did not. Um, um, at that point, after you put her to bed, what, if anything, did you do? Um, I went downstairs to get Burke in bed. Um, he was putting together a little plastic toy that he'd gotten for Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, I helped him finish it so he could get off to bed. And we did that, and uh, then I went to bed. Myself. When you say you went to bed yourself, do you remember um, exactly the sequence by which you prepared for going to bed that night? I think I took my clothes off, brushed my teeth, put my pajamas on, and crawled into bed. It's... Did you do anything else? Not that I remember. Uh, did you um, um, use anything to help yourself go to sleep? I took a melatonin tablet. Mm -hmm. Do you know the um, amount of melatonin you took? Was he joining you in bed that night? That's he was in bed before I went to bed. Uh, well, before I turned the light out. Do you know uh, or remember whether or not you read anything before going to sleep? I read for a few minutes, I, as I recall, before I turned the light out. Um, do you remember at any point uh, Patsy joining you in bed that night? Patsy was in bed before I went to bed. Um, do you remember what Patsy was wearing when she got into bed or was in bed? 
I don't remember specifically now. All right, uh, Mr. Ramsey, I'm going to ask you to look at uh, the document that's been marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 16 for identification, and I'm going to ask you if you recognize this document. Yes, I believe I do. Could you identify it, please? Well, it appears to be a copy of the ransom note that we found in our home. Does it look substantially like the ransom note that you saw that morning? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Now, Mr. Ramsey, I'm going to ask you to once again look at it, and I'm going to ask you if, in looking at it, whether or not you see any similarity between your wife's handwriting and the handwriting in the ransom note, you personally? Absolutely not. Uh, none at all? No. Not even a little bit? Not even a little bit. All right. Now, Mr. Ramsey. Um, Patsy writes very neatly. Mm -hmm. She's a feminine writer. Right. There's misspellings in the mm -hmm. note. She graduated at the top of her class. Mm -hmm. She doesn't misspell words like business and possession. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you think the uh, ransom note writer was trying to disguise their identity? I've been told that that was the intent, but there are parts of it that um, where that's broken down. I don't know which parts, mm -hmm. but. Do you think that maybe some of the misspelling may have been an attempt by whoever was writing this note to disguise their identity? I don't think so, because I think they tried to be very articulate to the best of their ability. And uh, the misspellings were because they didn't know how to spell those words. Uh, with respect to the sloppiness of the handwriting, do you think it's possible that the handwriting, uh, the, the person who wrote this handwriting was trying to uh, make their handwriting look sloppier than normal? I, I don't know. Uh, I, it's very sloppy handwriting. I would agree with that. Now, uh, Mr. Were you ever told that um, Mrs. Ramsey could not be eliminated from any of the handwriting investigation being done by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation? Were you, did anybody ever tell you that? I was told that um, it was virtually uh, certain that she did not write the note, but that there were some similarities which exist in all of our handwriting because we've all been taught the same. And that's how we communicate is with the written language in English. But that because of these few similarities, uh, she could not be absolutely eliminated, but it was highly improbable that she wrote the note. And that in fact, uh, there were more dissimilarities in her writing than a number of other people that have been looked at. Right. Um, do you know if your handwriting was uh, um, examined by the law enforcement? As far as I know, it was. Um, do you know um, whether or not you were um, eliminated as the, as the author of the note? I was told that uh, on a scale of 1 to 5, Patsy was placed at a 4.5 mm -hmm. in terms of probability. In other words, a very low probability. Mine was a 5. Um, but just, just to go back to the one point that you made, was your understanding that the reason Mrs. Ramsey could not be eliminated was because of what is, I think, called style book similarities? We all go to school, as you say, we are taught to draw a certain, to, to make our letters the same way. Is that the reason? Uh, let me object to form the mm -hmm. question only because you've used what I think is meant to be a some form of a technical term, style book similarities. Yes. I'm going to direct uh, Mrs. Ramsey's attention to um, the writing that's what looks like is on a box. It says Ramsey Xmas, and then also looks like some writing on the lower right hand side, which just says Ramsey. I'm going to ask her to, to look at that carefully. And I'm going to ask her, first of all, if she can identify to the best of her ability what. Um, I'm just wondering if she can make out any of the handwriting, and if she can, can she with any degree of certainty tell me if she recognizes any of the handwriting? It's pretty hard to tell. Okay. can just simply say no or no. Not, you're not certain. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I can you. see the original, maybe. No, no, I, I understand. But based on this document, you're not able to no. determine. 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now. Okay, um, I'm going to ask the re reporter to mark this as plaintiff's exhibit number 10 for identification. Mrs. Ramsey, um, what I'm showing you is um, a series of letters, and I'm not identifying their source. I'm just simply showing you a series of letters. Said yourself, do you remember um, exactly the sequence by which you prepared for going to bed that night? I think I took my clothes off, brushed my teeth, put my pajamas on, and crawled into bed. It's... Did you do anything else? Not that I remember. Uh, did you? Um, um, use anything to help yourself go to sleep? I took a melatonin tablet. Right. Patsy was in bed before I went to bed. Remember whether or not you read anything before going to sleep? I read for a few minutes, I, as I recall. Call before I turn the light on. Is he joining you in bed that night? Patsy was in bed before I went to bed. The bedwetting issue. Mrs. Ramsey, we've heard you talk about that before, and what about the bed wedding with Chambray? It was not an issue. I mean, I've said this before. All children have accidents. If she was especially tired when she went to bed and didn't go to the bathroom before she went to bed, she could have had an accident. You know, it was few and far between. It was not a big deal. All four of our other children had similar experiences. You know, that was made much too much of something it's of nonsense. nothing. Absolute nonsense. Few and far between means what? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I didn't keep track, you know. Not enough to be alarmed enough to even to speak to a doctor about it. Okay. Questions? The screen. Did you hear anything? No. Did not hear a thing. Sadly, no. You were on medication that night? I had taken a melatonin tablet, which is supposed to help you sleep. Uh, Mrs. Ramsey, the clothing. Well, the police were suspicious because you had your makeup on and you had the same clothing as you had worn the night before. Mm -hmm. When did you get dressed? I got up in the morning, got dressed. I had, the night before, had put my pants and sweater and bra and, you know, laid across the edge of the bathtub and I picked it up the next morning and put it back on. You were not concerned about Burke? Did you check Burke? Yes. We checked, we checked this really quickly. Yes. You brought the note to John? I don't remember. I tell you, you just, you know, that you morning how you got the so note? chaotic. You don't? I don't remember exactly, but... Well, it was, it was... Uh, I started screaming, there's a note, you know... It and you look in John Bonet's room, she's not there. What's the first thing you do? Larry, we don't remember. This is three years ago. We've been. Larry, we don't remember. This is three years ago. We've been through this a hundred times. You wrote a book about it, so, I mean, you must have said... We, we, we outlined it in the book. Uh, Basically. I felt like I'd been kicked by a horse. The most horrible feeling. If you ever had that pang of missing your child in a shopping center just for a moment, yeah. that pain hit me squarely between the eyes and it never left it was a horrible feeling in the latter part of 1998 the then boulder county district attorney alex hunter brought the case before a grand jury compromising eight women and four men these grand jurors constitute a select group who have been privy to all the evidence presented by the prosecutors against john and patsy ramsey an anonymous juror from the panel chose to share insights with ABC News 2020 with the understanding that their identity would be protected due to potential repercussions. This juror admitted having minimal knowledge about the John Bonet murder before being exposed to the case evidence. They said, quote, I saw there was a little girl dressed up with, in my opinion, a sexual persona and it disgusted me and I turned off the TV, end quote. Over the span of more than a year, the juror and fellow grand jurors grappled with testimonies 
from numerous witnesses, even embarking on a field trip to the Ramsey residence. During this visit, they descended into the very basement to personally witness the crime scene. Describing the basement layout where John Bonet was found, the juror remarked, It was actually kind of an obscure layout. You come down the stairwell and you had to go into another room to find a door that was closed. It was a very eerie feeling. It was like somebody had been killed here. While the juror believed there was enough evidence to indict John and Patsy Ramsey, he expressed doubts about securing a conviction. There is no way that I would have been able to say, beyond a reasonable doubt, this is the person. Despite this, the grand jury recommended charges against the Ramseys, suggesting their belief that the couple had placed John Bonet in a situation leading to her death. In a surprising twist, the prosecutor nullified the grand jury's findings, asserting that he and the prosecution task force lacked sufficient evidence to justify filing charges against anyone investigated at that time. Subsequently, in 2008, the then Boulder County District Attorney, Mary Lacey, declared in a letter that she was absolving the Ramseys of any involvement in John Bonet's death. Patsy Ramsey had passed away from ovarian cancer in 06. Despite these developments, the investigation into John Bonet's death is officially considered open and active. So there you have it. That is my deep dive on the parents' theory of the John Bonet Ramsey murder. There are tons of theories on this case, and I would love to hear yours. So keep the conversation going in the comments section below, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists for more true crime content. And if that's not enough, you can join our Patreon. Don't have a tinfoil hat? It's okay. We'll make you one. It's that easy. See you guys in the next video.